Santo Mukherjee from ISI Kolkata today, and he's going to talk about a very interesting topic to all of us: uh, quantifying pressure and performance in limited overs cricket matches. So this uh, talk is based on their book uh, called Cricket Performance Management, published by Springer. So uh, all of you uh, are encouraged to also buy the book and read the book and. Uh, I'm sure uh, the Gonta will give a good overview of uh, what is inside the book, and uh, I can guess the cricket ground uh, in this picture. I think it's Sydney Cricket Ground. So, the Gonta, all yours. We usually go for uh, you know 75 minutes, but feel free to take less or more, uh, you know, depending on how you're prepared. So it's okay. Okay, all yours. Thank you. Okay, but. Uh... Thank you, Devashish, and a very good afternoon to all of you here. And I'm very happy to see that I have a very special uh, member in the audience who is still in class nine, which is great. So I hope that you enjoy my talk. Uh, so anyway, uh, before I start the actual lecture, I would do three things. One is I will thank Arunabhuda and Devashish for their help when we were in the process of writing the book because they gave us a lot of valuable inputs and encouragement. And the second thing I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you that this book is primarily the work of two of my co-authors who are here, Hemanto and Dibbojyoti Bhattacharji. I know that Hemanto is in the audience. I don't know whether Dibbojyoti has joined. Dibbojyoti, are you there? Anyway, so maybe Dibbojyoti has not been able to come, but Hemanto is here. They are both from Asham and uh, they are uh, respectively with Asham Agricultural University and uh, Asham University in Shinchar. And the third thing that I'm going to do uh, before I start talking about the specifics is give you an overview. So already Devashis has helped me by uh, recommending my book to all of you. So let me tell you a few things about the book and why I hope you will buy it. So this book is about uh, cricket performance management and performance in all aspects of the game. So let me move to the second slide, which is a sort of blurb on the book. So what, what are we uh, talking about in this book? Uh, the book focuses on the application of data mining techniques in cricket. And by data mining, I, I do not mean very hard technological data mining, but rather you know soft data analysis techniques, which even undergraduate students of statistics or economics or even management would be able to uh, follow and handle and replicate. We provide a lot of examples of how these data mining techniques can be helpful for different aspects of decision making in sports. But of course, our special references with cricket. But if you do read the book, you will see that many of these references applies to other domains of sports as well. And even in cricket, we uh, focus particularly on 2020 cricket because the data on 2020 cricket has been quite rich in recent times and there is a lot of interest in 2020 cricket. So the quantitative features related to this 2020 version of the game would be our primary focus. Uh, the book also highlights how to quantify performance of cricketers. And when I say performance, as I said, it's all aspects, batting, bowling, all, also all round abilities, wicket keeping, all those things. So we want to try, we, we try to quantify performance and based on the performance, we try to determine what is the possible market value of the cricketers. Because the IPL auction has proved to be a minefield of very useful analysis, statistics, economics, or even maybe other subjects. And determining the market valuation of cricketers based on their on-field performance has become a very serious business now. And there is also a little bit of analysis on effect of age on the performance of cricketers. We provide a comprehensive overview of the different aspects of the game, wherever quantitative techniques are beneficial. Numbers tell a lot of stories. And in cricket, particularly, numbers do, do tell you a lot. 
and the highlights of using statistical and data mining tools in analyzing this data and then arriving at objective decision making is a big part of the book. And the book has been deliberately kept at a reasonably less technical level so that it, should, it appeals to a wide readership. So we are not only talking about postgraduate students of statistics and mathematics, we are also looking at practitioners, sports management bodies, and in general, uh, we hope that anybody who is interested in cricket would, would find this book interesting to read. So, all right, so this is uh, enough about the book. Now, let me uh, get to the subject matter at hand. So, and this slide is, by now I understand, is completely unnecessary. It's an introduction to the basic rules of cricket, which I am going to use in the presentation that follow. So in cricket, what happens is uh, the team batting first will set a target for the other team to achieve. The second team has to attain the target within a specified number of overs before losing all its wickets. So in a, in a very simplified, very cut down version, this is the objective in any cricket match. So the, sec the team batting second will need to maintain a scoring rate and it cannot lose all the team wickets. This is the premise. So what happens during this run chase? So because chasing is with a deterministic target, so we will talk about the run chase or the second, the team batting second first. So we are going to spend more time on talking about the performance measurement of the team batting second. And then we will try to go back to the other part of the question, what happens about performance measurement for the team batting first, which is a harder problem. So during any run chase, the team has to take care of two things, required run rate and preserving wickets. And this uh, we call our X and our Y. So these two combined together will essentially give us the data, will generate the data to measure performance. A little bit of notation to be used throughout. T is the target for the second team. Diganto, by mean, uh, measuring performance, you mean performance of individual players, right, or teams? Um, uh, we mean both. Okay. We are going to talk about the team uh, and then also individual performance from batting and bowling perspective, both. So at least in this talk, we are, I'm not going to be able to cover all the all the topics that we discussed in the book, but I'll just show you a, a table of content in, in a few minutes. The topics that I hope to cover today. Okay, thanks. Okay, so the notation is uh, T is the target runs. Uh, RS is run scored by team B at any point of time. So RS is essentially indexed by RST, where T is the number of balls bowled. K is number of balls consumed by team B. So, so RS at any K is what we are going to look at. We are going to define uh, some ratios and these ratios will give us our important metrics. So one ratio is the remaining run as a proportion of the target and the inverse of remaining balls as a proportion of total number of balls available. And, and as you can see, I am already focusing on T20 cricket because my uh, number of available, total number of available balls is 120. And this factor, the product of these two numbers is called, right? So, okay, so just to be, uh, complete. So this is my <coughs> required run rate calculation and which we write in shorthand as CI. So proportion of runs remaining and divided by proportion of balls remaining. So we will work with this quantity.
and as you can see this is my x this is my indicator for the required run rate okay so so basically what i'm looking at is what is the current required run rate as a proportion of the initial required run rate which i uh, write in short and the ci what is the other side of the story the other side of the story is the resource the number of wickets suppose i call w the number of wickets lost so i know that there is total stock of 10 so w is the number of wickets lost so my uh, usage usage of resource may be defined as just a fraction like this number of wickets lost by 10 which is the maximum possible so i can think of some increasing function of this as an impact on pressure because if this ratio is larger that means i have lost more wickets that means the pressure on the team chasing has increased of course we will get to a more uh, intelligent formulation than this but this is the basic structure so let me just uh, go back one slide one part of it is the required run rate compared to the initial one and the other part is the number of wickets that i have already lost now the way we try to combine these things is try to bring these things together into a resource utilization metric so ru is my resource utilized by team b at any instant so resources in terms of numbers in terms of balls etc and we can propose that if i define a resource utilized metric as ru then this kind of an increasing function of that could work well to indicate the impact on pressure due to whatever resources i have already utilized for instance how many wickets i have already lost and this is the y part this is actually the y part okay so a little bit more about the y part because as i said i do not want to make use of such a naive formulation as just the number of wickets lost because i am sure that all of you know that the position of the batsman definitely makes the loss of wickets in the first two three more valuable than maybe the 8 9 so i just cannot say that all of them have the same weightage or they have the same impact on the game so instead of uh, this possibility what we really want to work with is some kind of a weighted scheme so our resource lost should be measured in in a some kind of a weighted scheme where the weights pertain to each of the batsmen in the team so there are 11 of them and this weightage has to be calculated based on their performance for instance this was this is one possible way of computing the weightage of each of the batsmen in the side suppose i am looking at the indian t20 team in march 2016 sorry uh, the players in the team are listed here how do i understand the weightage of these players with respect to the team suppose i only look at their icc rating for batting performance so this is the icc rating as on 7th march before the start of the t20 world cup so i use this rating as the indicator of the importance of each player in terms of batting and then i normalize it i normalize in such a way that the average the average is 1 i normalize the icc bat rating points so that the average is 1 which means the total should come to 11 which is just a matter of uh, 
subjective normalization. I, I can make it one, I can make it 100, it doesn't matter, but as long as I have a clear cut norm. So this is what we would like to use. So we would like to use this weightage and our proposal for weightage is, I look at the ICC rating points, which I take as the weight of individual players. How do I understand their relative position in the team? I look at the normalized score. And that normalized score is in this third column here. All right, so are you all with me? Yeah, yeah. I'm just, I'm just using the ICC rating points to create the weightage or relative importance of each player and then normalizing them. It's a very standard, simple procedure, but uh, it gives us an objective way of evaluating each position. Okay, now let us go back to the uh, great uh, cricket statisticians, Duckworth, Lewis, and Stern. So the resource utilization idea originated from this team. So it was originally Duckworth Lewis, and then it was modified by uh, Steve Stern, which we are now using with little bit of modifications. Even now it is being used in international cricket as the DLS system, and which is being used everywhere and criticized all the time, but it is still a good option. How does it work? Duckworth Lewis essentially works on the resource utilization principle. So you look at how many overs are already gone and how many wickets are already lost. Based on that, you create a resource that a metric which tells you how much of the total resource you have already used up. The total resource you start with is the total number of overs and 10 wickets, which is normalized to 100. And then as you keep losing wickets and you go through overs, your resources go down to zero. And this is a sample table. So <clears throat> the X axis is wickets lost and the Y axis is overs bold and you can see how much resource I am using up when I am going through the overs ball by ball or I am losing weekends. To illustrate, so suppose I am here, my score is 10 at the loss of two wickets in 1.2 overs. So I am here and I am here eight balls and two wickets are lost. And that means I have used up this much 11.84% of the resources to score 10 runs. So that's a simple use of Duckworth-Lewis. But of course, we see Duckworth-Lewis more in case of rain interruptions when there are adjustments required to the target scores. But this is what happens in the, this is the uh, background template. Okay, so this is our basic idea. So I have some resources which I am utilizing. I have a target which I am trying to achieve. So I'm looking at the required run rate as a ratio with the original run rate. So I'm comparing and I'm looking at the utilization on the other hand. These things together tells me about how much pressure or how difficult I am finding the match or how difficult is the win going to be for me. <clears throat> so this is our next, uh, so in this part, this is our proposal for quantifying that pressure with one single number. I had two dimensions, the target and the resource. <clears throat> so I would like to combine them together to get one single number which will indicate how much pressure or hardship I am facing in my goal of winning the match. 
can I ask a question? That oh, sorry, 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 I don't know. Go ahead, go, go ahead Devasis. I'll ask after you. No, no, I was just thinking like, is this a zero sum game in the sense that the pressure on team A is just one minus the pressure on team B or what? Uh, yes, effectively that is absolutely true. Okay. Okay. Okay, and in P P I one. Uh, you are not using uh, overs, right? Is that right? I mean, the difference. No, no. Of course, I am using overs because that is in the. No, no, no. On the right hand side, on, on in the, the in the required run rate. Yeah, yeah. The, on the, second rate, the second one is for the uh, batting weightages. Right. So it does not use. Uh, I mean, the second one, for instance, are you over hundred? That is some combined. This thing of wickets and runs, right? Uh, wickets and overs. Whereas uh, uh, the thing on top does not have that. Exactly. So, so, so that is why these are two alternatives that we can look at. Okay. So, so the okay. So, so let me uh, maybe just pick it up uh, right here. That one way of doing it could be just looking at the weightage of the batsman as one part of the metric, and the run rate. On the other side of the metric, an alternative possibility could be: I look at the run rate in both the parts in some sense, because here I have the required run rate directly in the first term, but in the resource utilization, I also have the number of balls that have been used. So these are two alternative proposals, and you see the difference that. The the use of in-game resource, which is the number of balls available to me, that is used on both sides here. That's one possibility. But in the first proposal, the in-game resource is only used in the first component. Uh, just to point out something, I mean, uh, it seems like some. I mean, uh, in the current stage or even in the earlier stage. If if a team if India bats second and loses Tendulkar, then the pressure would be tremendous. Uh, you know, so that is clearly not highlighted in PI two, right? I mean, PI two would not take that into account at all. PI two would not take that because PI two is anonymous. Yeah, 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 exactly. PI two is anonymous. So so the big big difference between these two formulation is PI two is completely anonymous, whereas PI one. Is actually looking at individual performance data. Correct. Correct. Okay. And so, and the use of the multiplicative form. I mean, what implication does that have? And the exponentiation. Uh, right. So both the exponentiation and the multiplication are just one possibility. It just makes the computation simpler and easy to interpret. But there is no axiomatic foundation for this. See, I, I started to think of what kind of axioms you might use in this idea. Oh, okay, <laughs> all right, okay, okay, but but we we haven't thought about that. It it was just like so. So basically, the multiplication and exponentiation would be easy if you are trying to look at some sort of elasticity kind of computation, and it's a more of an empirical convenience. Well, I mean, you know, if you have a multiplicative form, then the axiom that you want to say is that when you divide something, then uh, <laughs> uh, you know something should be independent of something, uh, stuff like that, right? I mean, uh, you, 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 you. Anyway, we can talk about it later. I mean, uh, <laughs> this is an interesting problem in itself. I, I I understand, but uh, that is not something that we have thought through clearly. It was more, as I said, more of an em empirical convenience where calculation of elasticities would be easier to do. Uh, okay, all right. So so as uh, Devashish very nicely pointed out, that PI one and PI two are different in 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 some crucial aspects. PI one actually looks at the identity of the player. Identity, as in the rating, but PI2 is anonymous because PI2 is looking at historical averages over many matches, as in the Duckworth-Lewis uh, philosophy. But uh, the indices are normalized in such a way that 
they will start from one and they will go to zero if the B, team B actually wins. And if the team B is actually going to lose, then it goes up uh, to infinity eventually. So, so empirically, they will behave in similar manner, but the composition and hence the story is different for these two. Okay, so uh, you can also uh, play it smart and you can say that, okay, I want to give some weightage to both of these features and uh, let's take an average. So let's, let's use both PI1 and PI2 with uh, half and half weightage as a simple average and use it as my resource utilization metric. So you can do all sorts of things. And as I said, uh, we did not really put much thought in and you know, uh, logical foundation of these measures. Our focus was more on empirical convenience and computational suitability. Okay, so now let me uh, start uh, the first example. This is uh, the T20 World Cup 2016 final. England versus West Indies, 3rd April, almost five years ago now. The final happened at Eden Gardens. This is the final scorecard. So England scored 155 for nine and West Indies chased this down successfully in the last over with two balls and four wickets to spare. So West Indies got 161 in 19.4 overs. So that's the match. Now we want to look inside the match. So West Indies was chasing 156 in 120 balls. And uh, these were the batsmen opening for them. And these are the batsmen who were finally participated in the run chase. So this is how the match progressed. The fall of wickets and the scoring of runs. So the first wicket, second wicket. So this is exactly like in our ESPN Creek Info. So you show red dots for wickets and the blue worm for runs. The batsmen who are getting out are being crossed. And these were some highlights. Root getting a wicket, Samuel scoring a 50, etc. The sixth wicket at 107, but then the match was over. So this is what happened here. So the story uh, which structure index was it? Which is it PI1 or PI2? Uh, these calculations are on PI1. One or two? One. 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 This is on PI1. So this is how it ended. So as you can see that if I measure the pressure index, the pressure index was going up quickly, but eventually it stops here because West Indies wins the match. So this was the 19th over, then the 20th over where this pressure went up to this number six, something like six, but Eventually, West Indies won and the match finished with two balls to square. So this is what we are going to look at as our data. So again, let me, uh, let me, how do I go back? Right. Just, just, I'm sorry, I'm just 
want to go back. So we had these proposals, pressure indices. We first talk about the first one, PI1. This is our first example, the final match. And this is the final position. So the pressure going up and up, and then it finishes below, right at zero, because West Indies actually won the match. So this is one summary in the pressure index language of a cricket match, at least the second innings of a cricket match, to be more precise. OK, so, um, so what are the possible applications of this pressure index? So one straightforward thing is we can simply look at this graph and understand uh, how much the fluctuations happened, et cetera, et cetera. But that is just a very descriptive way of talking about a match. We want to do much more than that. So what are you going to talk about? So these are the things that I'm going to talk about in this presentation today. It's a subset of the things that can be done with this. And as I told you that there is a book where all these and other issues are discussed. So we will talk about uh, turning points. We will talk about performance measurement in terms of batting, bowling, and batting partnership. So batting and batting partnership is very important together. And then there are some miscellaneous applications, uh, yes, uh, about uh, outcome prediction. Can we predict the outcome with some intermediate observations? Can, uh, how to define something called a dominant team? And also how to compare run chases? So if there are two similar kinds of run chases, can we compare them? So these are the questions that we try to answer using this pressure index computation. Uh, Digonto, just returning to your pressure index thing, uh, I mean, you know, uh, one aspect of this index is that it, uh, you know, is it using any historical uh, data in this? Because for instance, suppose you are in the 19th over, and, and you require only, uh, let's say, uh, five runs or something like that, then there should be no pressure, right? I mean, and somehow, yeah. how, how is that going to be reflected at that point? Yes. Uh, because, uh, see, sir, suppose uh, we, we are talking about this match where the initial asking rate was like something close to eight. So if we take this example, yeah. so it was something close to eight. So if you have just five yeah. runs remaining in the last over, then you know that definitely this number is much less than one. So I what, whatever is I mean, huh? Yeah. I mean, so suppose you are interested in something like the probability of winning from that point. Uh, yes. As, 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 a, as, a, as a sort of a pressure index. So, I mean... Uh, uh, we will do that. Okay, okay. We will okay. do that. Yes. Uh, let, let me also ask a, another question. So, it seems like you're building this pressure index by looking at the resources of the team that is batting. So, these Ws are the weights of the batsmen. So, is there a way Bats to incorporate the, uh, you know, the number of overs left for bowlers also and their weights in some sense? Uh, right. That is, like that is good death bowlers. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, uh, yeah. so for instance, in fact, if, in fact, uh, uh, if, that if, is precisely yeah. the kind of analysis we are going to use to uh, measure bowling performance. Okay. Because if India has used up Bumrah, and basically, even though, uh, you know, the other team has lost Joe Root, you know, they might be okay. Uh, you know, the pressure index should not be that high, you know, so. Right. You are absolutely right. But that we have not done, frankly. But it's a very interesting idea. Okay. Thank you. It's a great idea. And we will try to look at this. What we are doing right now at this point is we are doing it the other way around. Given the chase history, the pressure index history, can we quantify the performance of the bowlers depending on which overs, who bowled which overs? Okay. okay. So, so we can 
we can definitely discuss this further because what you have just said you know, is, is a great idea. Okay. So uh, let me uh, talk about these possible applications. And uh, again, uh, just uh, stop me, ask me questions because I want a discussion. Very much. <clears throat> okay. So this is the final situation of the of that uh, T20 final match, world, world T20 final match. So the pressure index for West Indies went up up to this about, about six, came down. West Indies won the match. So two balls to spare. So this is the point where the pressure was highest, and. Then there was a sharp change. So descriptively speaking, this is definitely some kind of a turning point. But what do we really understand by a turning point? That is something to be discussed because this happened right at the end of the match where few balls, few runs, things can change very quickly. So this is one possible application where in, in a, in a at least in a 20 over format, can we identify turning points or crucial moments? So, so what, what uh, the, the commentators say that this is a game changer. So that would be one possible use of this pressure curve. Are there game changing moments? Okay. A second example because I want to highlight some other things. Individual performances are our next agenda. So the example uh, that is being used here is a, again, a World T20 group match between Bangladesh and India and the team that wins make it to the semifinals. Happened in Chinnasamy Stadium, 23rd March, 2016. The result is India won by one run. They scored 146. Bangladesh stopped at 145 for nine. This is the pressure car for the second innings. Bangladesh chasing and falling one short. Uh, this is how it looks like. It remained high because much more than one, Bangladesh actually losing, but losing by a slender margin. So it is not something like going to infinity. It is just about again between five and six, but a loss. Diganto, um, I have a, a question. Yes. Um, so is it um, something like, um, so do you have any correlation with um, with uh, betting rate, uh, let's say? So uh, sometimes you have dynamic betting going on, rupees and you know, those kind of things. Um, I am sure there would be, but we have not accessed betting data. Yeah, that would be, a, uh, I mean, uh, since you're talking about the use, uh, I mean, if there is a correlation, it will be the greatest use you, you can think of. Yeah, absolutely true. Absolutely true. And again, uh, very good suggestion. Thanks, Rajneesh. Uh, the, 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 the objective is, is clear. The only thing we have to figure out is uh, how to uh, access the betting data in the intermediate points because I guess it like, should be it should be available. I mean, uh, I mean, of course, after this, you would think we would like you, a continuous time data then during the match. Yeah, yeah, I guess uh, it is there. It's there. I mean, yeah. at least it, okay. like, I mean, it should be. I mean, at least I feel that. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. okay. Yeah, yeah but, but that would be a great application. Thanks again. All right. So, so this is the example we are working with. If we want to look at, in some sense, turning points, this is something like a turning point. But this is also a turning point. So this is all within the last one over, last six balls, where the pressure curve took big jumps 
both directions downward and then back upwards and of course you know the final uh, outcome what more can we say so our next agenda item was how to measure batting performance or batting achievement and for that we need not only how many runs in is scored in how many balls by a batsman but we also need to quantify what was the importance of those runs in the context of the match so scoring runs just the number does not tell you the whole story you all know this it depends on the situation of the match so instead of runs what we are actually going to look at is something that we call adjusted runs and how do we do this adjusted runs so rij is the run scored actual run scored so i will just uh, show this uh, table first and then go back so this is what we are talking about so this is the west indies england match and uh, the first batsman scored one run from seven balls and in the context of the match the adjusted runs turns out to be 0.47 so what we, what are we talking about basically cost of the run right who's uh, uh, scoring more runs under what pressure actually the other way benefit of the run yeah benefit okay. of yeah. yeah so what are we doing this is the actual run this is the pressure index and so okay so, so just to fix the notation so this is uh, over and batsman r i j is i f over j is batsman So this is the jth batsman's performance in ith over. So when the batsman comes to the crease before, this was the pressure index at i minus one. This is the average pressure index through the match, and the square root of that is used as a scaling factor for the actual run scored. So instead of looking at actual runs, I look at a scaling factor. which definitely gives a boost to the current pressure situation so if i am scoring runs at a higher pressure situation my runs are valued more and that is the adjusted runs star r star if i aggregate that if i aggregate it over all the overs i get arj star which is the just the sum and accordingly i define the adjusted strike rate which is the adjusted runs by number of balls so if the batsman has faced seven balls at the beginning of the match and scored one run then given the current pressure the initial pressure and the average pressure the adjusted measurement of those runs adjusted value of those runs just works out to be 0.47 of course if you score runs faster their value will be more but it is also important at which point of the match these runs were scored so if you scroll down this uh, for this rows you will see that the number of runs vis a vis number of balls definitely matters but it also matters where in the match these runs came and correspondingly you can look at the original strike rate in terms of our traditional runs per 100 balls or you can look at the adjusted strike rate and you will see that there is substantial difference between the two things because we are adjusting for the position of the match all right so this is something that uh, we talk about for example look at samuels look at brethwet samuels scoring at 128 strike rate which is valued at 132 brethwet scoring at 340 but it is valued at 
Diganto, uh, where is that adjustment calculated? Like Samuels, for instance, may have batted 10 overs or something like that, right? So it's the uh, pressure index over those 10 over, over by uh, over by over uh, over by over. So this is uh, aggregated oh. over by over. The sum is over overs. So the uh, the current situation is measured at the start of the over and updated once the over is completed. Okay. Okay. Similarly, we can also think of bowling performance. So the bowlers also are bowling at different situations, conceding runs or getting wickets, and the valuation of those are also dependent on the situation of the match. So suppose I say that IIJ is difference of the pressure index values at the end and start of the ith over by the jth bowler. So J, the second index is always for the player. The first index is for the over. So the difference in the pressure value is I. And suppose NJ is the total number of overs bowled by a particular bowler. It could be at different points of the innings. So our candidate bowling performance indicator for this particular bowler J is then exactly how much difference you have created in each of the bowling overs averaged over the number of overs. Do you know that? Hmm. Yes. You know that? yes. So uh, I think what uh, Devasis suggested uh, about, suppose one bowler has been exhausted already that gives some impact on the you know pressure of the batsman pressure of the of, of the batting side yes batting side so this can be probably accommodated uh, in your average kind of situation where you are putting the average i think that can be a weighted average can it be done like that um possibly but it has to be done recursively you see because we are updating it at the end of each over Mm -hmm. So we have to do a recursive formulation. I have to think more clearly because Devashish's idea is a very nice one. So mm -hmm. I think it it deserves some thinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It looks, it sounds very interesting now. But yeah, you are right, Shudajit. We, we should be able to do something like that. Maybe we can talk about this again. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So this is the bowling performance indicator. And uh, let us look at an example. So this is David Willey bowling in the match, England West Indies match. <clears throat> At the beginning of the over, the first over, of course, the pressure index has to be one. By definition, it is one. At the end of the over, the index was 1.066. So Willey's contribution, or rather, <laughs> the cost is. 0.066. David Willey actually bowled the first, third, 16th, and 18th over. Every bowler can bowl at most four overs. So his cost is the sum of the four differences that happened in those four overs. And if we do the calculation, it turns out to be 1.1621. So what are we doing? We are looking at each of the overs bowled by the bowler and looking at how much difference has been made to the pressure index value. And I average them. So in our definition, the performance indicator for David Willey is 0.2905. So it's an average of the four overs that he bought. Now let us uh, see the whole match template. The complete match template. And this is color coded now. Color coded by who bowled those over. As we know that David Willey bowled the first over, then the third over. And then he bowled the 16th and the 18th overs. And this was the pressure situation curve. So 
we can easily enumerate how much difference this molar made in terms of pressure. The green belongs to Joe Root. He bowled only one over, he got two wickets actually. And the other bowlers are also color coded like this, the last over being sent down by Ben Stokes, where the match was finished. West Indies winning. So these are the Stokes uh, overs in the picture. This is Jordan. Adil Rashid. Root, just one over. Plunkett. And David Lee. So, how about numbers? Wheeling, we have already calculated 0.29. These are the other five bowlers. Root sent down only one over. This is the contribution. Rashid, Jordan, Plunkett, and Stokes. Stokes is a big negative because the pressure was reduced a lot in the last over because West Indies won the match. So his aggregate, his average turns out to be negative. But this is our bowling performance indicator using the pressure index calculations. Okay, so as I said, uh, we also wanted to understand how the part performance of a partnership in batting can be measured. We are not only interested in the individual batsman because in, at any point of time, there is a pair of batsmen. You can also say that any point of time, there is actually a pair of bowlers operating. And that is also something that uh, we are interested in quantifying, but that's in a different context. Let us talk about the batsman partnerships. So what is the, our metric? So PI, SI is our pressure index value at the start of the partnership. So start, I start with PI, SI. And when it finishes, my pressure index, suppose it is CI. So start and close. And BI is the number of balls faced by that partnership, by the two batsmen together. Delta PII for the IA partnership is then just the difference in the pressure index beginning to end. So this is the gain divided by number of balls used into 100. So it is like how much pressure we are gaining or reducing. Here gain is a reduction. How much pressure are we reducing per ball during a partnership? So again, uh, going back to our first example, West Indies batting second, chasing successfully. We look at this partnership between Bravo and Samuels, which scored 75 runs in 69 balls. The pressure situation at the beginning of the partnership was 1.49 and it finished with 2.83. The other partnership involving Samuels that we want to look at is this one where Brathwaite and Samuels scored 54 in 25 balls. And in this partnership, there is also a increase in the pressure up to 2.99. So how do we evaluate them? How do we evaluate these partnerships using our metric? Bravo Samuels, strike rate 108.7, pressure contribution is minus 1.3. The other partnership, Brathwaite Samuels, 54 from 25, pressure contribution is high positive 2.99. 
and the third one in between Russell and Samuels, 18 from 7, their contribution, even though the strike rate is higher, their contribution is much less, 0 0.0682 in terms of pressure. So you see, the way we are looking at the match is not exactly in terms of strike rates or just run score. It is also the situation of the match. And depending on that, even a higher strike rate may be valued less in terms of how much we are facing, what kind of pressure we are facing. So one way to use this kind of cal calculation is to identify for a particular match, which pair minimize the pressure the most, which pair can be sort of identified as instrumental in reducing pressure. We can also use this kind of calculation for over a series of matches for comparing performance of different partnerships over a longer span of time. This is the second uh, application of the pressure index. So we talked about batting, bowling, and partnership performance. Those are individual performances. Now the second group of application relates to the team, team as a whole. Here, what we are looking at is an empirical way of the prediction problem that we discussed initially, that looking at the pressure index can we in some sense make good predictions? And how to do that in that case? So suppose these are some sample pressure index curves from a number of matches. The black ones that end up here where is where the steam batting second have lost. So they have not been successful in chasing. And these red curves which go down are the successful chases. So can we somehow categorize them with intermediate information? That would be interesting. Uh, in fact, what Rajneesh said, it is, is it is more interesting if we can uh, match it with the betting data, real-time betting data. OK. So suppose we try to look at the match at an intermediate point of time, halfway. And then try to predict the final outcome. So I look at the situation at the midway of the second innings after 10 overs, and then I try to predict. There are two possible outcomes. I can lose, I can win. Can I make a better prediction at this point using the inf additional information of whatever has happened so far? This we do in terms of a simple statistical analysis called discriminant analysis which is nothing but partitioning any data into two groups. And our strategy here is the following, that we look at the end of the power play at the end of six overs of the second innings. We have the target score because it is the second innings. We have the pressure index values from the beginning, from the first over, till the sixth over, ball by ball. So this is our data. So end of the power play, this is our data. What are we trying to do? Based on this information, can we use some statistical analysis, in particular discriminant analysis, and forecast the outcome? Of course, to do that, we need to first use a sample 
of marked data where the outcome is already known and use it for learning the discriminant function. So this is how the analysis go. Our discriminating variables are the target score and the pressure indices at each at the end of each of these six overs. This is our data. What do I want to predict? Only two categories, win or loss. So this is the outcome of the analysis. A little bit of statistical jargon, but you can ignore the uh, symbols. All we are trying to highlight is all these factors turn out to be important in predicting outcomes, which is quite intuitive. They are very much important. And the classification function can be explicitly found out, which is in this box, but this is a better picture. So I have these seven input items. I combine them in the loss predictor as a score or a win predictor as a score. That is how the discriminant analysis works. So discriminant analysis essentially creates a partition in the data. One half is, one part is the loss, other part is win. And I want to check how good is my classification function in matching with the actual outcome. That's how we find the best possible function. Okay, so uh, this is the, again, this is the, outcome prediction analysis, which we can do again using the pressure index. And we can also check the performance of this analysis by matching with known outcomes. Okay. Next item is, is there any way of defining a dominant T20 team based on historical performance data. A dominant team. For that, I will need the performance data from a large number of matches, pressure curve based on several chases, bigger data, the better my analysis. So suppose this is a sample data. Some of the matches have been won, some of the matches have been lost. I have a reasonably large sample. Now I look at an empirical version of what we call the conditional probability. I try to find cutoffs above or below which the outcomes are quite sharp. If I consider a pressure value of three as my cutoff, for this particular data, I can see that there are 10 visits above three, 10 times the pressure went above three, and all of them resulted in a loss. None of these curves are showing a win. If I reduce the cutoff to two, then out of 19 visits, 13 resulted in victories. The other six are those which crossed three. And finally, if I look at the other side where the pressure was reduced already, it's a 0.5, then 10 visits all resulting in victories. So these are of course very sharp results, but even in intermediate points, I may be able to get reasonable conditional probabilities.
and this is our calculation so we look at the pressure index and we look at the corresponding probability of final win and obviously the results are very intuitive that if the pressure indices are very low you are almost sure to win when they are very high you are almost sure to lose but what happens in between is the difficult prediction problem when the pressure index is say in this range of 1.1 to 3 in this range the outcomes are not so sharp but can we see a pattern here a pattern that relates this conditional probability of victory with the pressure index value. And this is roughly the pattern that we can see here. The pressure index goes up, the probability certainly comes down, and it comes down in this following shape. And that gives us an idea of fitting a reasonably nice looking function to the empirical results. This is like a growth curve. This is due to Wilde and Saber. And this model fits our data reasonably well. Using that, so this is the fitted curves with the functional form. We look at performance of different teams. So in particular, we look at four teams here. India, blue, Australia, yellow, West Indies, red, and New Zealand, black. Their average performance with respect to winning probability vis-a-vis -vis pressure index that they faced. And this is one way of visualizing that which teams are more dominant at what kind of situations on an average. So let me look at this uh, example of these two matches together and see what happened there. These are two matches belonging to two IPL editions, final of 2012, final of 2014, both won by Kolkata Knight Riders. So you can see that the selection is biased, selection of the example. But these are the match summaries. Kolkata chased successfully both cases. <clears throat> so these are the two pressure curves for these two matches. both resulting in the win for the chasing team. So pressure comes to zero. So this is a comparative picture of the two IPL finals. Okay, uh, so before I uh, you know, keep talking, so the Devashish, should I stop here or should I continue for five minutes? Uh... So you have about uh, five minutes. So if you want to continue for five minutes. I'll just talk a little bit about the other, other problem that I indicated at the beginning. Uh, I will just spend five minutes then for addressing this problem. What about pressure index for the first innings where there is no target? There is no deterministic target. So what happens? So whenever we are computing pressure index, an important input is the target. And for the first innings, we don't have a deterministic target, really. The teams always say that, okay, this would be a good score, that would be a good score, etc. The commentators also say, okay, historically, this is something like a good score, but how the team should go about it? And also, how do I measure performance in a first innings? Because if I am not able to do it at all, I'm essentially losing 50% of my available data because 50% of my available data pertains to the first index. And performance is there, cannot be directly evaluated using this kind of a metric. 
So good. So what we look at is historical data. We have this uh, T20 matches and the first inning scores. This is a sample spanning over three, four, five years. Actually, actually more because there are even matches from 2008. So we used a large number of matches. We try to fit a curve which will predict our first inning score reasonably well using some statistical statistical tools we try to fit a distribution to the first inning score and as always our candidate is the normal distribution easiest to work with and we estimate these parameters so suppose i have fitted this normal distribution with this mean and this standard deviation, then I can make a statement like this, that probability of getting more than 185 in the first innings has a chance of 16%. So this is venue specific, right? Of course, this would be venue specific. This would also be time, time range specific, but I'm just trying to illustrate how we can go about it. Okay. Example, 2017 India versus England, India scored 2002 batting first. Jumaraj got 27 from 10 balls. And this was one of the overs. England actually lost the match quite badly but that is not the main thing that I want to tell you. What I want to tell you is what Kohli said after the match. This one over from Chris Jordan to Jubudaj, where he scored 6-6-4-6-1, six, 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 that was the momentum changer. We were thinking about 175-180, but that's the ability he has. He pushed us past 200. So this is what we want to quantify. There is no target, but can we quantify this kind of a performance? That it's pushing the average or the expected target upwards. Okay. So using that idea, so for Eden Gardens, so based on data, we have an initial estimate of 185 runs. And then we look at the intermediate time points and we say that, okay, at over T, what we are going to set as our revised target is the following. The revised target is of course, the runs already scored plus whatever resources I am left from the duckworth Lewis table times bigger of these two numbers. What was my initial expected run rate, which is 185 by 20, or whatever is the existing run rate at this point of time. So whatever I have achieved so far, or whatever is my expected, the bigger of these two times the resource available to me. So this is how I can revise my target in intermediate points of time, which put in the other way will show me how much the batsmen are performing, how well the batsmen are performing in the first innings. Example, so suppose a team playing in Eden Gardens is currently at 115 for three in 10 overs. So TT at 10 overs is 115 plus 52 percent resource and maximum of these two rates and current rate was higher, which means now the target is revised upward to 216. So if I know this, then I can get the pressure curve for the first innings of the batch. So then I have created a pseudo data.
so i will not look uh, talk about this points because i have run out of time so i will just thank you and if there are any comments questions you will be very welcome and thank you already for the interesting questions and comments you have already put in thank you diganto so if there is any question uh, please uh, unmute yourself and ask Good evening, sir. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so actually, I had a question. Is there any way in which we can actually put a some emphasis on uh, that halo effect when we are calculating the pressure index? Because uh, in reality, what we see is that performance uh, pressure is not directly related to performance. For example, Chris Gale comes and his ICC rating, which is very less now because he is not playing regularly in international cricket, but the moment till he is in the match the pressure is less on the team why because he has such a great reputation that kind of effect uh, uh, if we if we can include because that is the way like i have seen the commentators comment uh, on the game of cricket and how it is structured yes i would respond in the following way that is that reduction in pressure really justified is it justified by the by the final outcome because if not then i would rather look at an historical average of performances and ignore the halo effect because the halo effect if if it really doesn't help the outcome of the match then it is not important to me because you see in all my calculations it's the outcome that matters okay sir so is there a, is there a need to uh, account for the power play especially in the in the pressure index calculation i mean uh, i think it's a minor thing but I, i'm just curious because there are fielding restrictions uh, you know in in power play and 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 a reduction in pressure at that time maybe less valuable than maybe later perhaps yes yes i think i think it it is it is it is very logical uh we have not incorporated that in in any of our measures but yes that would be a nice thing to do going forward yes in fact dear brother mm -hmm. uh, there could be another component of the filling oh that the is players. already there in the book so you have to read my book and buy my book okay first. okay okay <laughs> this is a subset of the book so <laughs> filling is there filling and in, and in particular wicket keeping also uh -huh. so the pressure index has uh, also uh, some influence over uh, the fielding or maybe fielding can influence the pressure index in fielding can definitely influence the pressure index of course yeah okay any other questions okay thank you very so much you also डॉक्टर Lewis, uh, are you uh, are you measure? Yes, yes. Uh, there is no sense in which uh, you know I could say something like you know getting ten runs and over uh, of the final over is is an easy target. You know, is easy historically. I know it can be done quite easily. Uh, that is not quite clear from your uh, PI index, and right? I think. it's a very good measure by the way to measure everything in terms of the evolution of the pi index uh, is a is i think a, a, a very good idea yeah. but why not use this uh, in some some historical notion of even for the team batting second uh, you know instead of just a formula yes I, yes i i understand what you are saying yes uh, that that would be that would be a good thing to try yes So, Just like you're doing for the first, so we can consider the historical data as a prior, and then uh, refine the prior to a posterior based on the current data. That yeah. would give us sharper uh, 
prediction intervals. Yes. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. And another very uh, completely unrelated to your uh, talk, but just a question about statistics. You know, like player statistics, we only use averages, right? We for a batsman career average, Test cricket average. And uh, nothing about the second moment, nothing about the variance. Uh, you know, we are going to judge a batsman just by just by the average. I mean, uh, you know, isn't it time to revise the opinion or opinion of all the cricket greats? Uh, you know, according to things like variance. For instance, how much they contributed in a in a tight situation. Uh, you know how. They uh, succeeded when others failed. Those kinds of indices. I mean, uh, actually, so 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 that's the part I did not cover here. But that that batting performance, the career batting performance, is also covered in the book, where you look at, as usual, at the pressure index contribution of that batsman over a number of matches, because the, the absolute number of runs may not tell you that story. This is, for a, this is for a T20, right? But I, I was thinking more in terms of, I'm not a fan of T20. I, you know, test cricket, for instance. Uh, you're looking at a, a person's career over 20 years. You're comparing, uh, you know, Gavaskar and Tendulkar and Virat Kohli, for instance. You know, uh, the astonishing thing is, one third of Gavaskar's innings ended before he scored 10. Right? So, it's a, it's a, uh, you know, we, but if you look at their batting averages, Gavaskar is 50 point something, Tendulkar is, uh, you know, 50 something. Slightly higher, course. slightly higher, 52, I think. 52. 53 or something like that. So, I mean, but it's not showing uh, the, the full, uh, you know, even, you know, this pressure index calculation, even for test matches, how many, it's, you know, criticism of Tendulkar is that he never won matches. Uh, uh, you know, in fact, matches he could have won, he didn't, you know, he, he, he lost uh, by getting out, you know, like Pakistan in, in 99 and all that. So, yeah, I mean, that, uh, that ran out. Well, yeah, he was, uh, yeah. So, I mean, somehow even, I mean, conventional things, I mean, using these ideas, I think we can get much better ideas of, uh, uh, even in test cricket. I mean, that's what I'm trying to say. Uh, I, for, 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 I, for, I very for, much hope so. I very much hope so that people take it seriously and actually apply it to a broader context. Because test matches, even though they are theoretically open-ended, there are still some bounds because we are going to have at most 450 overs in the match. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yes, it, it would be great if people take that take that up. Yes. Okay. Thanks, Digod. Very interesting. Thank you, Varun and uh, thank you, Devashish. Thank, thank you, the you. audience, for your patience. Thank Hopefully, you. Hopefully, we will be more interested in looking at the book now. Anyway. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank Bye. You. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Digod. Nice presentation. Thank you. Bye.